I was looking for an entree, Jean Dubuffet wrote in 1945, about his prior attempts to launch an artistic career, but it didn't work. In 1917, at the age of 16, he had taken art classes in his hometown of Le Havre and briefly attended the Académie Julien in Paris in 1918-19. But he gave up painting in 1924 and reluctantly entered the family wine business in 1926, as his strict father had demanded. However, in 1933, de Buffet turned to art once more with a series of papier-mâché masks and marionettes of friends, only to drop it again in 1937 for financial reasons. By this point, his father had died and his first marriage had failed, so he resumed the wine trade, now in his own in Bercy. Only in 1942, after his discharge from the military in 1940, tellingly for an act of disobedience, a failure to salute properly, only then did Dubuffet find his entree into art, and it took the paradoxical form of a departure from it. In fact, his was a double stance, one taken against art that he deemed official, including modernist forms as well as traditional ones, and for art that he called brute, his ambiguous term for images and objects that were unscathed by artistic culture. Raw is one translation of brute, outsider is another. I will stick with brute. And de Buffet relished that, of course, it was it's also uh, the class of a champagne. There was more art and poetry in the talk of a young barber than amongst the specialists in art and poetry, de Buffet declared, also in 1945. At the time, he was preoccupied with the expressions of the common man, l'homme de commun, as he was with the drawings of children in the years immediately before, and as he would be with the art of the insane immediately after. This was his way to work through the modernist exemplars of cultural otherness, the primitive, the child, and the mad, that he inherited from predecessors like Paul Klee and Max Ernst. As this path led de Buffet to his notion of art brute, the primary concern of my talk today, we need to retrace it. But first, a word of caution. Although he saw genuine art as more modest than official art, these are his terms, de Buffet was anything but humble, and he was as sophisticated about cultural matters as he was outspoken about them. In short, his own work was not brute. It could not be. And in the end, he understood brute to be a heuristic. The man without culture, therefore integrally asocial, we all agree, does not exist, de Buffet wrote in 1968. He is a utopian vision. On the one hand, then, we cannot charge him as crit critics routinely have with sheer hypocrisy. On the other, he did manipulate art brute for his own ends. This is simply to say that de Buffet was adept in the strategies of the avant-garde. After all, his entree as departure follows a logic of inscription, familiar since Gauguin, if not Manet or Courbet, whereby in order to win a place within modernist art, one makes a move outside its ambit often to an other projected as primitive. Rather than invalidate brute, however, this ambiguity, this duplicity, if you like, might well be central to its operation. Here's my thesis. De Buffet sought a ground for his work in art brute, which he approached in sequence through the drawings of children, the graffiti of the common man, and the art of the insane. Initially, he deemed the child prior to culture, the common man hostile to it, and the mad oblivious of it. Eventually, however, he saw that these were largely projections of his own. De Buffet took up each avatar of the brute in turn, a 
assimilated it in part, then put it aside. This is how he proceeded both in his art and in his writing uh, in the first decade of his mature work, which is as far as we will go with him today. In a final iteration from his Haute Pot or High Impasto paintings of the late 1940s to his nearly abstract series like the Texturologies of the late 1950s, Brut became a matter less of source and subject than of material and process. Yet even this ground proved to be equivocal. This is another of his key words. Okay, Brut Avatar One, the child. In 1942, I was looking at the drawings of children a lot, de Buffet once commented, and there was an exhibition of this work in Paris at the time. Although this interest was hardly his alone, mediated, mediated as it was by predecessors like Clay and Ernst, it did redirect his work. Prior to this moment, de Buffet was concerned mostly with nudes, male and female, in a style that combined aspects of Matisse and Picasso. That is, in a style that could qualify as official, officially avant-garde. By 1943, however, both the schematic drawing and the arbitrary coloring of the art of children are evident in his painting. If there is a distinctive attribute of his work of that year, it is the hieratic frontality of his figures. Often, as in God de Col, they are posed symmetrically, sometimes cropped at the knee, hip, or waist, and presented full on the frame. Sometimes, too, they fill the support completely with heads lined up, a characteristic of much art de Buffet would soon dub brute. And he carried over this frontality in subsequent paintings of rural scenes. In canvases such as Boko la Vache, the conventional perspective of pictorial space is flattened into horizontal bands or stack sections in a way that, again, evokes child drawing. De Buffet also adapted this compositional device to urban paintings, as in his several Vues de Paris, where the frontality of the facades is well suited to such treatment. This tipping up of the ground to the vertical plane recurs throughout this decade of his work, as does the converse move, the incising of the figure into the flat field of the painting. Here then, his involvement in the art of children is not foreign to his engagement with modernist art. On the contrary, in an instance of the avant-garde gambit I noted a moment ago, the outside play serves the inside game. At the time, the preeminent authority on the art of children was Georges-Henri Luquet, a philosopher who wrote widely on psychological and anthropological subjects. Luquet based his 1913 dissertation about the art of children on the drawings of his daughter Simone and developed his findings in Le, Le, Le Design Infantin of 1927. Children draw for fun, Luquet wrote there. For them, drawing is just like other games and it's interspersed among them. Since they make marks for pleasure, any resemblance to things in the world is fortuitous. Soon, however, children strive for similitude, but fall short due to obstacles of control. They do not yet possess the synthetic capacity to render most proportions relationships and dimensions accurately. Yet this failed realism prompts a conscious choice that is essential to this art. Children draw what they know, Luquet insisted, and not what they see. They hew to an intellectual realism that is distinct from the visual realism of adults. Although Luquet did not mention contemporaneous art, in modernist fashion, he did see both kinds of realism as conventional. That is, even if most children accede to visual realism eventually, this outcome is not necessary. In fact, Luquet asserted, children become disenchanted with drawing about the time they acquire the concept of visual realism 
and its fundamental commitment to perspective. According to Luque, intellectual realism is governed by internal models. That is, the object depicted by the child exists in her mind more than in the world. And she is more faithful to this mental type than to any mundane referent. In fact, she aims to conserve this model at all costs. Hence, her sign for a horse or a house will reappear in whole or part in drawing after drawing. Luque called this insistence graphic automatism. And if the image seems wrong to the child, she's apt simply to do it over on the same piece of paper. What defines the type is its exemplarity. The internal model, Luque writes, is not meant to represent an individual object or person, but a category of objects. To achieve this goal of a generic image, the child works to present the greatest number, if not all, of the essential elements of the represented object and to preserve each in its characteristic shape in itself, as it were. It is this imperative that leads the child to her intellectual realism, which adults see as distortion, but she regards as fidelity. And in this matter, she proceeds logically. For Luque, the central principle of intellectual realism is transparency, according to which the child depicts aspects of an object, even if she cannot see them, toes within a shoe, say, or furniture inside a house. She depicts them because she knows they exist. This transparency underwrites two other operations. In the first device, objects are often projected onto the ground surface, and elements situated in different planes in a scene are set one above the other in tiers so that they're not even partially occluded by those in front of them. In effect, this is an early intimation of the architectural modalities of the plan and the elevation. Luque calls the second device, also dedicated to transparency, rabattement, a term adapted from geometry that signifies the rotation of a plane figure in order that it is represented fully in plan. The child applies rabattement to the supports of objects in particular, the legs of an animal, say, or the wheels of a car, which thus appear folded out in a way that from the perspective of visual realism, does not appear supportive at all. However distorted such drawing appears to adults, Luque insisted that it is realist. The act of children betrays little evidence of two tendencies opposed to realism, schematism and idealism. And the non-figurative conception of drawing seems to be alien to them as well. Yet again, this realism is not the usual one. Viewpoints change, even combine, within a drawing, such that people appear both frontally and in profile, buildings in elevation as well as in plan, and so on. It is the internal model of the object that is important, not the perceptual view of the subject. In time, however, the child encounters objections from adults and develops skills of her own. And gradually, she gives up on intellectual realism, on exemplarity, transparency, rebattement, and all the rest. They are schooled out of her, and the protocols of visual realism schooled in. I hope this is enough to suggest not only how de Buffet drew on such art, but also why he took it as the initial basis of his work. For the art of children, which he included in his Art Brute collection from the beginning, speaks directly to concerns essential to his brutal aesthetic then in emergence. It has a strong claim on the motivated. Children draw solely for their own personal satisfaction, not for others like parents and teachers. On the fundamental, according to Luque, this art reveals prime elements of all picture making. And on the general, we were all child artists once. This last point was especially important to du Buffet. I like to paint general facts, he remarked in 1943. 
And he wanted his early figures, such as God de Caux, to evoke archetypes. Of course, these broad concerns with the necessary, the essential, and the universal are quintessentially modernist. So too are the particular qualities typical of child drawing, such as flatness of image, frontality of figure, ambiguity between horizontal and vertical planes, and composition understood as tabulation more than tableau. Like Picasso with African sculpture then, so de Buffet with the art of children, he turned its attributes toward the ambitions of modernist painting. At the same time, he did not collapse his elaboration of child drawing into official art, modernist or other. In no small measure, the frisson of his relevant paintings, such as Femme se coiffant, arises from the treatment of traditional themes with childish techniques. These works stray from modernist precepts in other ways too. For example, his version of childish frontality in picture making does not always align such all overness with all at onceness, such facingness with instantaneity a la modernist painting. In the art of children, an image tells a story. It involves time. And this is true in Dubuffet as well, especially in works like this one. Intellectual realism allows children's drawings to be, in their representation of space, a kind of flat sculpture, Luquet writes, and in their representation of time, a miniature theater. Much the same can be said of many Dubuffet paintings of 1943-44. They constitute an intellectual realism of their own. In some canvases of these years, Dubuffet evokes the child in another way as well. Consider l'accouchement, which presents childbirth as a little boy might imagine it. A man and a woman stand dressed in formal black on either side of a naked girl who lies, arms and legs extended almost hieratically at right angles on a dirty white rectangle that we come to read as a bed. The mixed viewpoints, most dramatically the vertical disposition of the adults juxtaposed with the horizontal orientation of the girl are characteristic of child art. So too is the transparency evident in the breasts of the woman and the rebattement of the limbs of the girl. There are other childish attributes as well, such as the schematic drawing and the arbitrary coloring, figures outlined in greenish yellow, skin painted in reddish ochre. Yet Dubuffet channels the child in a manner that also exceeds Luquet. As Freud first argued in his 1907 or eight papers on the sexual theories of children, children are riddled by questions of origins, of gender, of sexuality, of life as such. And curiosity about babies becomes the prototype of all later thought on problems. Sexual difference is stressed in l'accouchement. Male and female are denoted by the simple signs, the simplest signs, such as breasts for women. And the source of the child also seems obvious. A male baby falls head first from the crotch of the girl. But are sex and birth so clear here? According to Freud, boys intuit the vagina only at the age of 10 or so. Remember, he wrote in Vienna in the early 1900s. And they first speculate that babies arrive by way of the anus. One benefit of this initial theory of colaco birth is that it accords men the ability to bear children too. The fantasy of male creation ex nihilo, which is strong in movements such as futurism, is born at this moment as well. And in fact, the whole here is ambiguously rendered. It could be vaginal or anal. In any case, we seem to be born between feces and urine as Freud remarked after Augustine. L'accouchement, the stages a childish confusion about birth, perhaps a childish consternation, which is conveyed formally through the estrangement of the figures 
and spatially through the disjunction of the planes. Its vertical horizontal ambiguity recalls that of Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, a key intertext for l'accouchement. For here too, the viewer is placed in the position of a subject faced with a traumatic scene. And this traumatic initiation seems to concern not only the secrets of childbirth, but also the ways of patriarchy. For we understand the man and the woman to be the bourgeois parents, maybe petty bourgeois, of the excruciated childbearer who delivers the infant for them. In time, de Buffet would evoke the child at the level of material and process too. But at this point, he moved away from this avatar of the brute, even as he retained aspects of its picture making. I realized that children have an appetite for the civilization of adults, de Buffet later explained. They want to be adults. In other words, he deemed them insufficiently anti-cultural to count as truly brute. That was not the only reason for his disenchantment. Their art comes in time to express a cultural transcription of the world. A house, a tree, the sun, a dog. I feel their art depicts a language, the language of their elementary vocabulary. The painting of children is completely dictionary. What does de Buffet mean? On the one hand, he turned to children to unlearn what they had not yet learned, the conventions of visual realism. On the other hand, he sought to turn the childish vices of synthetic incapacity, semi-arbitrary color, and the like, into the modernist virtues of his own art. Yet in doing so, de Buffet came to see what Luquet had always known, that the intellectual realism of the child comprises a set of conventions in its own right, more that it insists on a strict correspondence, not between signifier and referent, as in visual realism, but between signifier and signified, that is, a transcription between pictorial image and mental type, such that this stig figure always equals the internal model of a man, or that rectangle topped by a triangle always equals the internal model of a house. A transcription stricter in its way than any in visual realism. But then, in one of the, the fundamental double binds of the entire Brute project, de Buffet was on the side of the very acculturation that he lamented, as he would be with his other avatars of the Brute too. If anyone constructed a dictionary of pictorial transcriptions, a house, a tree, the sun, a dog, it was de Buffet. Already it was the constriction of his own language that he chafed against. In 1944, I was interested in old walls, de Buffet remarked, and the drawings on them. Evidently, his interests in the art of the common man overlapped at least briefly with his involvement in the art of children. In any case, by 1946, he was all in. It is the man on the street that I'm after whom I feel closest to. In the first instance, the common man stood for found expressions in the city, graffiti above all, that are anonymous in origin and collective in address. The second avatar of the brute was thus positioned as both an artist to emulate and an audience to engage. For de Buffet, this was an improvement. Even though he valued child drawing as a primal form of art, it remained a private one. Graffiti was primordial in its own way, and it was public to boot. Moreover, it did not issue as child drawing did in adult image making. The messy opacity of the urban wall also resisted the official paradigms of the picture, the transparency of the window and the reflectivity of the mirror. Finally, its aggressivity appealed to de Buffet. The graffitied image is attacked even as it is made. Representation and destruction seem to converge, and this convergence is often sexual, heterosexist, and impulse. While the K guided his engagement with child drawing, Brassai mediated his involvement with graffiti. 
De Buffet met the Hungarian photographer in 1944. By 1947, they had agreed to collaborate on a book on graffiti. It never appeared. For Versailles, the discovery of the wall by modern artists was an historical event every bit as important as Cubism. It was not only uncharted territory artistically, but also truancy's blackboard socially. In his view, graffiti thus constituted an elementary language without any clear official status, whose anachronistic and spontaneous quality confers on it a strange topicality. Note the layered temporality in this statement. We will encounter it again uh, next week with Georges Bataille on cave painting. Anach anachronistic and spontaneous, elementary and topical, graffiti brings together the primordial and the contemporary. One sees why it would appear as a strong candidate for the brute appellation. In summer 1944, toward the end of the occupation in Paris, Dubuffet produced Massage, a set of six works of phrases scrawled in ink on newspaper, often German newspaper, in a manner inspired by graffiti. Like graffiti, these notes range from the innocuous, the keys under the shutter, to the obscene. This one here translates, and pardon my French, de Buffet is a filthy cunt, a loser, an asshole. They are vulgar in the sense of both common and offensive. Also, though there is an elegance to the script that the artist could not unlearn, the massage are materially aggressive. I abuse the paper, I tear it up, de Buffet wrote uh, his new champion, the critic and editor, Jean Paulin. I scratch it, I abrade it. As Rachel Perry has argued, the massage thus perform a defilement that is not only physical, but also linguistic. The message frequently breaks down, as well as subjective. De Buffet is an asshole. Medium, language, and self are linked. The implication is that the occupation has degraded all three. De Buffet depicted graffiti directly in the work that followed Massage, a set of 15 lithographs titled Les Murs, produced in early 1945 to accompany 12 paintings by the resistance leader, Eugène Guevec. However, apart from the shared subject of walls, there is scant connection between image and text. Instead, Du Buffet draws an analogy between lithographic stone and urban mural. Both are dark grounds scratched with white lines in the form of initials, names, and signs, such as a phallic gun and a bald profile, a recurrent emblem of the artist. The sketchy figures in Les Murs appear dispirited, tormented, even condemned, the critic Noël Arnaud commented at the time. One recumbent figure is even entombed. You see him at the bottom there. This is appropriate given that the walls in question were associated with the zone, an area in Paris used for summary executions and clandestine burials during the occupation. Again, Du Buffet evokes a degradation of the self. Often the haggard men in Les Murs appear to merge with the dilapidated walls. One image is titled L'homme coincé, as in wedged or cornered, and another shows a man with an X on his chest, as though he were marked along with the wall or even targeted against it. Contrary to the famous exemplum of Leonardo, whereby the true artist can conjure new pictures from mere stains in a wall, here the figure threatens to collapse into the field, the subject to detumes into the space around it. As rehearsed by De Buffet and Les Murs, graffiti is on the side of the formless. The you know, form, of course, is a key term in Bataille that De Buffet takes up. Again, representation is turned toward destruction, another Bataillon theme, portraying toward defacing a particular interest of Versailles and attention 
toward distraction. One of the poems in Les Murs reads in part, walls are good as screens against the gaze of passers-by who find neither form nor lesson there. Along with degradation, there is also defiance in Les Murs. The figures appear discontented as well as damaged. In one image, two men, on face on the left and profile on the right, pee on opposite walls below a schematic skyline. One surface shows the date of the lithograph, January 16, 1945. Various names and nasty phrases and the initials of both de Buffet and Guvec. Apparently, they are the two pissure. What is the nature of the aggressivity on display? If we follow Freud, it stems from our hostility to the social demand that we renounce, repress, or sublimate instinctual gratifications for cultural ends. In Civilization and its Discontents of 1930, he argues that the values of beauty, cleanliness, and order deemed to be the fundaments of civilization originate in a reaction formation against the messy opposite of these values, our anal and urinary eroticism as infants. These surrogates for de Buffet and Guvec react against this reaction formation. In turn, they piss on it, in fact. However, in doing so, they might only confirm the structure. This is another double bind, the one of transgression, that sometimes ensnared de Buffet. De Buffet also moots a relation between authority and violence in Muller O Inscription, painted soon after Les Murs in April 1945. To the right stands a schematic policeman in dirty gray. To the left appear chalky splotches on the wall in the same color, along with the usual initials, names, expletives, and exclamations. An analogy is again drawn between medium and wall, and both are marked aggressively. Whatever color exists in this world has drained to the bottom. De Buffet depicts the flick in childish fashion, the body turned outward, the head in profile, but more meanly, perhaps, than a child would. Although he is not as wasted as the men in Les Murs, his legs and arms are spindly, and though he watches over the wall, his demeanor is brittle. The civic authority of both wall and police are in doubt. In fact, in all these images, the walls are barely intact. They are decrepit as well as despised. At the same time, the aggressivity depicted and enacted appears puerile. In keeping with much graffiti, Les Murs suggests an adolescent attack on the sociopolitical order, as though it were simply a parental regime to rebel against. In the end, the aggressivity seems mostly reactive and largely abstract, a political limitation of the art of the common man that de Buffet carried over into his own practice. As with child drawing, de Buffet moved away from graffiti once he had assimilated its effects. Once more, he contributed to its acculturation even as he condemned that very operation. Years later, when asked if graffiti qualified as brute, de Buffet replied, yes, but it is very feeble. Much of it is useless, merely copying. With copying, he points not only to the conventionality of graffiti, its given code of sc scratched homunculi, initials, and expletives, but also to its automatism, the sheer repetition of its signs. But how is it feeble? Here Du Buffet might acknowledge that graffiti is an acting out, or is largely so which suggests that he came to see this avatar of the brute as limited by its very aggressivity. In another instance of the double bind of transgression, graffiti is constrained by its own discontent with the civilization that it attacks. On this view, if the child only accedes to official culture, the common man merely lashes out against it, and that is insufficient. Again, de Buffet projects his misgivings about his own brutish work onto his brute avatars. 
For me, he concluded, there is only one art, and that is to recreate the world entirely. In the end, graffiti did not count as brute any more than child drawing. So what could? Brute Avatar 3, The Insane. In July, two months after Mur au Inscription was painted, De Buffet traveled to Switzerland in the company of Paulin Le Cabousier, weirdly, and the Swiss writer Paul Boudry in order to visit psychiatric hospitals. It was there, for example, that he met Adolf Uffli. His collection of art brut began in earnest with this celebrated trip. In fact, prospecting was its primary purpose. De Buffet had already ruled out folk and naive art as models of brute. He felt that they were produced by simple people full of respect for cultural art. What remained then, after both child drawing and graffiti were found lacking, was the art of the insane. At least initially, it did not appear dictionary like child drawing or repetitive like graffiti. And unlike folk and naive art, it was unaware of official culture, or so de Buffet thought. In short, it seemed unscathed. De Buffet was hardly new to the art of the insane. He had encountered the artistry of the mentally ill, the influential compendium of work collected from various sanatoria by the German art historian turned psychiatrist Hans Prinzhorn on a prior sojourn in Switzerland in 1923 just a year after it was published. I wasn't able to read Prince Horn, de Buffet recalled, but the pictures struck me very strongly. Although the book prompted him to correspond with a few doctors and patients at the time, this source remained latent in his art for over 20 years. It was not until he passed through child drawing and graffiti that he returned to it, or rather, as if in deferred action, it returned to him. That said, his work shows morphological similarities to the art of the insane even before 1945. In the interval, of course, the Nazis had declared the art of the insane one of the root causes of the degenerate condition of modernist culture. If drawings by children often misrepresent sexual difference, Pictures by the insane frequently dislocate the body, and sometimes in a way that suggests a connection between a disturbed psyche and a distorted body image. After all, the ego is, in the first instance, an imago. If it, if it does not cohere, its representations are not likely to cohere either. Typically, significant parts of the body, especially eyes and mouths, are grossly enlarged or disruptively plunge into other parts, so that eyes become breasts, mouths double as genitals, and faces appear in torsos. De Buffet experimented with such derangements of the body image, often in a manner that corresponds to works in the artistry of the mentally ill. His pictorial affinities with Hermann Biel, one of 10 schizophrenic artists picked out by Prince Horn for special attention, are close. A frontal presentation of schematic nudes, sometimes rearranged, often splayed, and always embedded in the support, which for Beale tended to be toilet paper, a use of lowly materials that must have appealed to Du Buffet. Apart from such distortions of the figure, what did Du Buffet see in the art of the insane? Such work is even more motivated than child drawing, given that made under its own compulsion, it anticipates no viewer and acknowledges no audience. I think, importantly, Lynn Cook has challenged this assumption in her show, but it was certainly the assumption of artists like Du Buffet. The brute artist wants to do it himself, he commented, like a fish who excretes the water in which he swims. At the same time, it seems to display even more freedom than child drawing, for its intellectual realism is even further removed from visual realism, or 
one can argue. The insane introduce pure caprice, pure mental invention, with absolutely no visual justification, Dubuffet claimed. Everything per was permitted, everything was possible. Although these two attributes are clearly contradictory, compulsion on the one hand, freedom on the other, they became central criteria in his modeling of art brute. At first, Dubuffet did not distinguish between the brute and the insane. Many, nearly half of the objects in our exhibition are by inmates of psychiatric wards, he wrote in Art Brute Preferred to Cultural Art, his introductory text to the first showing of his collection in October 1949. At this time, it consisted of some 200 works by 63 artists. Not only are both alien to official art, Dubuffet argued, but all genuine art is touched by madness. In this way, he presented both the brute and the insane as radical instances of the romantic genius free of all convention. Here is the crucial passage in the essay. We understand by this term brute, works produced by persons unscathed by artistic culture, where mimesis plays little or no part. These artists derive everything, subjects, choice of materials, means of transposition, rhythm, styles of writing, etc., from their own depths, and not from the cliches of classical or fashionable art. We are witness here to a completely pure artistic operation, raw, brute, and entirely reinvented in all of its phases solely by means of the artist's own impulses. Prince Horn had presented the art of the insane in terms of essential expression, while Clay had formed it in terms of direct vision. Both are modernist idealizations, in keeping with primitivist projections of purity, that Dubuffet carried over to Art Brut, for he also referred this work to primordial depths. However, unlike his predecessors, he imagined this pure source less as an origin of art to reclaim redemptively and more as an outside to art to tap transgressively. I believe very much in the values of savagery. I mean, instinct, passion, mood, violence, madness, he wrote in 1951. Yet this positioning was problematic too, for even as Dubuffet questioned the distinction between normal and abnormal, who after all is normal, he asks. He also opposed Art Brute to cultural art in a binary that rendered the latter more stable, not less. Again, this is the double bind whereby transgression comes to support the very law that it aims to contest. In fact, for its primary theorist, Bataille, the purpose of transgression is to reinscribe the sacred basis of authority that secular modernity had ero eroded, as we will see next time. As glossed by Michel Foucault, transgression is profanation in a world which no longer recognizes any positive meaning in the sacred. It is a way of recomposing its empty form, its absence, through which it becomes all the more scintillating. So the, the double bind here is that transgression breaks the law, but only to to reinscribe it. And this is one double bind that I think, again, de Buffet is often caught out in. This double bind indicates a blindness in de Buffet, but it might point us to an insight into both art brute and insane art. This insight is twofold, involving subjectivity as well as society. First, far from unscathed, the insane are scarred by trauma. And again, the psychic disturbance is often registered in the figural distortions that they produce. Through similar disfigurations in his own work, Dubuffet evoked this psychotic condition of self-dislocation, which is thus far from the completely pure artistic operation that he ascribed to Art Brut. This is a contradiction Dubuffet could not resolve, again, compulsion versus freedom, a blocked subjectivity 
on the one hand, pure invention on the other. The second insight involving the social is less explicit. The derangements in the art of the insane point to a world that is debilitated, not empowered, and hence to an understanding of transgression that accords less with the subversive account of Dubuffet than with the reparative understanding of Bataille. In other words, rather than attack the symbolic order as Dubuffet would have it, the art of the insane is concerned to find such a law again even to found such a law again, at the very least to recompose its empty form, its absence. For often this is what mad artists behold in horror, not a social world that is too fixed that they wish to contest as such, again as posited by avant-gardist logic, but a symbolic order that is not stable at all, that is in crisis, even in corruption in the etymological sense of corrupt as broken up. Far from anti-civilizational rebels, as Dubuffet first imagined them, insanity represents a refusal to adopt a view of reality that is imposed by custom, he asserted. These artists are desperate to construct a surrogate civilization of their own, a stopgap order in default of the official one perceived to be in ruins. In this respect, they might be the ultimate positive barbarians. In early September 1950, almost a year after his first exhibition of Art Brut in Paris, Dubuffet visited the Prince Horn collection in Heidelberg. I was one of the first to see it after the war, he recalled. I spent three days going through it. I was disappointed. Dubuffet did not specify his disappointment other than to say that only a few artists exhibited true creativity. Although this assessment does not fit with notes taken on his visit, which surfaced only in 2006, it does align with his previous dismissals of child drawing and graffiti. Again, that the first is too dictionary and the second mere copying. Somewhere along the line, the invention and freedom that Dubuffet projected onto the art of the insane became conventionality and constriction. His notes confirm his avant-gardist bent. Drawn to images that feature excessive disfigurations, he was indifferent to images that propose elaborate systems. He dismissed the fantastic cities and complex calendars of Joseph Griebing as without interest. He also notes gratuitously or not so gratuitously that he was a Jew. That is, Dubuffet favored works that appear to subvert order and disparaged others that attempted to reconstruct it. Several months after the disappointment of his Prince Horn visit, Dubuffet shipped his collection of art brute to the United States, where it remained for over a decade. This move was spurred by practical problems. The collection had become difficult to conserve. It had grown to some 1,200 works by over 150 artists. And the company formed in 1948 to oversee it, which included such luminaries as Paulin, Andre Baton, Charles Rattin, Henri-Pierre Rocher, and Michel Tapier, had fallen to infighting. Dubuffet dissolved it at this time, too. And yet, as we've seen, this project was also plagued by conceptual difficulties, such as his uncertain distinction between the brute and the insane, and the contradictory implications of both. Again, did they represent utter freedom from convention or complete submission to it? Perhaps, too, Dubuffet no longer required external exemplars of the brute. Perhaps he believed that this idea was now best developed within his own work. It did not hurt that he had achieved a modicum of success, financial as well as critical by this moment. Okay, the last avatar, brute avatar four, I guess. Dubuffet intimated a fourth version of the brute, one that shifted the category from an anti-cultural outside to official art, 
toward a phenomenological ground for art making and viewing alike. In effect, from the brute as a primitivist other to the brute as a modernist process. The first inkling of this version appeared in his Haute Pat that mix in heterodox materials such as earth, gravel, and sand to achieve the thick fracture for which they are named. And again, please visit the ones upstairs. You'll see the material right before your eyes. Begin in May 1945, or two weeks prior to this prospecting in Swiss sanatoria, these paintings were first shown a year later at the gallery René Drouin under the title Mirabilis Macadam and Company, Haute Pat. Mirabilis plays on Mirabilis, Latin for wonderful, while Macadam alludes to John Macadam, the inventor of asphalt, which Chibuffet also used. Modestly enough, the title thus suggests an imaginary company that makes wonders out of non-art stuff. Most viewers disagreed. The old pot were attacked not only verbally in the logbook, but also physically in the gallery. Two paintings were slashed and six others damaged. In an ironic twist for an anti-authoritarian artist, Dubuffet had to have a guard posted. Dubuffet called the macadams dandies and dolls made of mud. Satirical in spirit, many do take up social types, a man in evening clothes, a woman on a promenade, only to bring them low with the messy materials that make them up. As a group then, they suggest a painting of modern life updated from Baudelaire, with modern life now mocked rather than celebrated. One painting presents a mustachioed male with a stubby torso, big head, and teeth fashioned from pebbles. Despite its Nietzschean title, Will to Power, this uncivil character, as de Buffet called him, appears more naked than nude, more farcical than forceful. However, a few of the macadams do convey a debasement that exceeds satire, especially the ones with female subjects, sadly enough. As her name suggests, Madame Mouche is as much insect as woman. Arms raised, bald head in profile, naked torso straight on. Both her faces seem to scream out of the mud. Another naked woman looks directly out at us with a mad gaze. Though labeled Minerva, the Etruscan goddess of art and wisdom, she is really Medusa. Again, in Nietzschean fashion, Dubuffet aims to reset the charge of these classical poles. The brutification of social figures is only the thematic program of the macadams. Dubuffet declared the formal purpose in a short text titled Rehabilitation of Mud, written for the exhibition. Along with the degrading of the high, the title implies, there is also a redeeming of the low. Yet the two operations must be thought together, for what Dubuffet seeks is precisely a confusion of values. In cultural terms, the haute pot debase high painting, even as they also elevate muddy paste. While in pictorial terms, they raise up the ground, Dubuffet often worked on the horizontal, even as they also threaten this verticality with collapse, the haute pot are very heavy. His text proposes a further confusion of high and low terms. Why prize fur as a luxury and not tripe, de Buffet asks. Why covet necklaces made of shells and not of spiders? Dirt, trash, and filth, which are man's companions during his whole lifetime, deserve to be dearer to him, and isn't it serving him well to remind him of their beauty. Intended to shock, or at least to disgust, this provocation also tests conventions of value, which it frames as essentially fetishistic, that is, as the semi-arbitrary investment of specific things with a special worth that they do not intrinsically possess. Why sublimate some materials and not others? Why value some products and not others. 
In the end, Dubuffet does not side with either term, sublimation or desublimation, value or valuelessness. And here, I'm in a bit of a dispute with my friend, Yves Lambois. Rather, he wants to keep the two in tension, which is, which is to say, in transformation. What the wizard finds so thrilling, he notes, uh, he writes in notes for the well-read, another key text of this moment, is to transform. Beauty is into beasts, beasts into beauties. This is a highly instructive procedure. It is also a precisely equivocal one. Once more, his aim, I think, is to render values uncertain and viewers ambivalent. This emphasis on transformation was lost on critics of the Hutbat, who saw only defilement there. This is consciously scatological painting, one remarked, while another wrote famously, after Dadaism, there is, to be sure, Kakaism. <laughs> For these critics, this dirty painting was a mere scandal in the now expected manner of the avant-garde another quasi-infantile gesture against the order of renunciation and sublimation that Freud posited as the basis of civilization. Yet the Utpad also tap into a second understanding of the scatological. For Freud, the anal zone is one of symbolic confusion. The infant does not much distinguish between feces, penises, babies, gifts, and so on. Further, the prototype of all art making, his associate Ernest Jones claimed, is our infantile shaping of excrement. In effect, in his Ode Pot, de Buffet stages a return to a mythical first painting where everything is in flux, and he would do much the same or attempt to do much the same in his subsequent work. The essential gesture of the painter is to smear, de Buffet insisted, to the smear is not only to deform, but also to transform. All you need is mud. Here then, his mud, his oat pot, appears as a middle term, an equivocal term, between feces and paint, spiders and jewels, nature and culture. And it is this in-betweenness that this version of the brute explores. After all, brute means raw as in unrefined, not raw as in uncooked, which is crew. As Claude Lévi-Strauss, an early advocate of art brute, would soon argue, the raw of crew is opposed to the cooked of cuit, as nature is to color. Yet, as, as brute partakes of both crew and cuit, it equivocates between these opposites. In fact, de Buffet infuses his texts on art brute with culinary tropes. And he liked that his oat pot were not chemically stable, that they oozed what he called hippo sweat. In short, Brute troubles the structuralist binary of crew and qui even before it was proposed. And it disturbs other oppositions as well, neither literal nor metaphorical, neither figurative nor abstract. The Brute is pledged to keep not only material and process, but also meaning and value in, in permanent deformation and transformation. What the wizard finds so thrilling is to transform. In October 1947, Dubuffet staged another exhibition at René Duin, this one called Portraits under the ironic banner, people are far more handsome than they think. If the brute disfiguration in the macadams is satirical, in the portraits it is caricatural, even grotesque. And again, there's a, a great example upstairs. Like his masks from the 1940s, these are portraits in name only. Many of the subjects, literally literary friends and acquaintances, can be identified by the titles alone, most of which are riddled with misdirection. None of his subjects sat for de Buffet. Instead, with resemblance cooked and candied in memory, he depicted them along the lines of his private nicknames. For example, his old friend, Georges Lambour, dubbed the crustacean, was painted with crab-like arms and shell-like torso. Even though such creatureliness features in physiognomic 
studies from Leonardo and Durer through Delaporta and Lebrun, here it does not naturalize character, but denatures it. The portraits thus advance a paradoxical form of anti-portraiture. A portrait works well only if it is hardly a portrait, de Buffet argued, only if it blocks like likeness, even shatters it. This is to turn portraiture away from the traditional pursuit of an individual psychological look toward a brute presentation of the elementary human figure. Here his predilection for the general is again evident. And yet as caricatures, the portraits actually equivocate between the specific and the typical. For instance, Lambour is not lost as a subject so much as he is mostly disfigured and partly renamed. De Buffet spoke of his portraits as effigies, that is, rough models of particular people made to be damaged or destroyed in protest or anger. As in his graffiti images, representation and destruction, facing and defacing, iconophilia and iconoclasm converge. The species of mimesis pushes likeness away in order to foreground immediacy. And in subsequent work, de Buffet would do so more and more. In this way, his final version of Brute aims to solicit our engagement in the painting, even our participation in its process, at least imaginably. This Brute is thus phenomenological in orientation, as Hubert Damisch, its most important exegete, argued long ago. For Damisch, a student of Merleau-Ponty, de Buffet conformed to one of the clearest tenets of phenomenology, namely that natural perception engages all the senses at the same moment, and that each gives us access to the world in its sensorial plenitude and unity. In this account, de Buffet performed a painterly version of the phenomenological reduction, the bracketing of learn concepts for the sake of raw percepts. If de Buffet refuses for art to be a celebration for the eyes, Damish argued, it is because he places it at the originary level of sensation before the distinction of the senses. Hence the partial undoing of the figure field opposition in his work, long thought to be essential to the structure of perception and representation alike was undertaken to open up both to a wild, primitive state. Hence, too, the ground that most concerns de Buffet is not pictorial or even formal, according to Damish. It is the primal constitutive stuff that the body shares with other beings and things, whereby our flesh is enfolded in the flesh of the world. What could be more grounded, more brute, than this corporeal materialism? This version of the brute, then, is materialist not only in production, but also in reception. The painting will be not looked at passively, de Buffet insisted, but relived in its elaboration, dare I say, reenacted. On this point, however, this brute departs dramatically from other versions. As we've seen, child drawing, graffiti, and the art of the insane are relatively indifferent, if not entirely oblivious to the viewer. A disregard that once counted for de Buffet as prime proof that they were unscathed by artistic culture. This brute, on the other hand, is directly directed wholly at the observer. In this way, it is not simply recaptured for modernist art, for its culture of material and process, but already dedicated to it, already acculturated by it from the start. Here the brute is no longer brute at all. Just a final remark. In the end, no, no subject is unscathed and no ground is untouched. Again, as Dubuffet wrote in 1968, the man without culture, therefore integrally asocial, does not exist. He is a utopian vision. In fact, Dubuffet admitted, pure art brute does not know 
would not know how to exist. This recognition renewed an operation that he had intimated previously, one of ex-nomination. Recall that de Buffet was able to define brute only negatively, as not folk, not the child, not the common man, not even the insane. Yet finally, he sought to recoup this failure. His inability to name Art Brut became its refusal to be named. He thereby flipped a passive negation into an active ex-nomination, a stripping bear of names that complemented his phenomenological bracketing of concepts. Not only does Art Brut involve arts that have no name, he insisted, but it is an art that does not know its name. This is largely why Damish called de Buffet the anti-Duchamp. Where Duchamp nominates art, this urinal is a fountain because I, the artist, declare it so, de Buffet ex ex-nominates art, or attempted to do so. And where de Buffet aimed to render art more arbitrary, de Buffet seeks to make it more motivated. De Buffet posits ex-nomination as an operation of his own art, too. My weapon painting functions as a machine to abolish the names of things, he wrote in 1957, to knock down the partition that the mind erects between different objects, different systems. It is a machine to blur the entire order instituted by the mind, a machine to foil all reason and return all things to ambiguity and confusion. This refusal of nomination might also be understood as a resistance to interpolation in the Althusserian sense of the word. To be brute is to reject any hailing by power or any defining by authority. And this notion became a leitmotif of his writing. While official art needs to name all things, which denatures them completely, all genuine art hates to be recognized and greeted by name. But then, how do we reconcile his critique of naming with his own naming practice, his own cultural appropriation of the child, the common man, and the insane? Might this will to ex-nomination be a reaction against his own acculturation of art brute, indeed, against his own assimilation as a great artist? That is, if this were not the plan all along, and that's a big if. Perhaps in the end, we should see de Buffet as a signal modernist because of the double binds that he produced, not in spite of them. Double binds of a transgression that reinscribes the law, of an outside to official art that extends its purview, of an anti-aesthetic that acculturates the brutes. Thanks. <laughs>